so I'm speaking with uh, composer uh, Rob Simonson, who, apart from being a frequent collaborator of Michael Dana, has uh, scored great films like Seeking a Friend for the End of the World, and has recently scored two highly praised films that played at Sundance, The Way, Way Back, and The Spectacular Now. Thanks so much for speaking with me today, Rob. Absolutely, my pleasure. Uh, so I guess looking back on it all and kind of going back to the beginning, uh, what made you want to get into music, and how did you end up writing scores for film and TV? Um, my grandmother was a voice teacher and made sure that every grandkid got musical training. Um, although I really needed no encouragement, we had a piano and I was often tinkering around and figuring out tunes by ear and a lot of it was film music that I had heard. Um, obviously enjoyed movies a lot growing up and uh, I would uh, I would play out movie themes on the piano and um, in high school started playing with bands and was getting into jazz and whatnot and in college um, I was playing with bands a, a good buddy of mine scored a friend a friend's film um, in high school, a group of, of friends that I fell in with, um, we would spend our time on the weekends and during the summer making movies. And a lot of those guys ended up pursuing film educations. So student films started happening. And mm -hmm. one of my buddies scored another buddy's film and asked me to come play piano on it. And I did, and it was kind of like, it just dawned on me that this is something that people do. They they specifically write um, film scores. I, ne I had never really thought about it, even though um, I had always listened to soundtracks and loved Vangelis and um, Elmer Bernstein and John Williams and uh, all sorts of stuff growing up. Um, it never really dawned on me until that moment, and I I played on that score, and I was it's was kind of sold. I was like, <laughs> this is kind of it. And we made another film, um, the same group of guys, and it initially was supposed to be a short. And I was talking with the director, and we were bouncing off ideas about story and music and all this stuff, and. After my experience of playing on my other friend's score, I just kind of blurted out. I, I said, yeah, I'll do the music. And he said, yeah, you'll do the music. <laughs> and that actually, we didn't finish the short. Um, we got about 75% of the way done and then stopped and expanded it to be a feature. And there was a lot of walking. <laughs> and it's based on one character so there really wasn't a lot of dialogue and I ended up writing about an hour and a half of largely orchestral music and just kind of threw myself in and never really looked back and that film premiered at Seattle International Film Festival um, and during the festival I met Michael Dana who had he was kind of a guest speaker that had been brought to the festival and we I heard him speak and thought he had a lot of brilliant things to say and really respected his work and introduced myself and ended up getting invited to go to lunch with him and, a, and a, some other festival people and then we ran into each other at a party that night and really just hit it off and then um, I went to I went back to Portland. I was living in Portland, Oregon at the time, and Michael was living in Toronto. And I spent the next year after that festival scoring some other Portland-based films. And then decided that I really wanted to kind of uh, apprentice with someone else and assist and learn. And the only person that I knew working in the Hollywood studio system was Michael, who was living in Toronto. So I sent him an email and just said, hey, I'm thinking about moving probably to L.A. Um, would love to help you out if you need any help. And certainly if, if you need help in Toronto, 
I'd be happy to move there. And he wrote me back. He said, actually, I'm moving to L.A. and I will be looking for someone to help me out. And we ended up moving to town within a few days of each other. Wow. <laughs> after we both moved to town, uh, he called me up at like 8.30 in the morning and said that he had taken a film, which was Being Julia. And he said, uh, do you want to start right away? And I, of course, said yes. And then... Um, he let me work up underneath him and that was very much like graduate school and working with big orchestras and choirs and you know learning things um, at a very high level and um, we started you know straight up co-collaborating with things like management and a Canadian film called Even the Fire Horse and then 500 Days came around and around that time, I got my own representation, and he moved back to Toronto. I built my own studio, and here we are. Wow, that's a fantastic journey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you've worked a lot. I mean, yeah, you have worked a lot with Michael, and uh, and a lot of composers have taken that path where they work under uh, a high-profile composer. Um, and during your years with Michael, what have those experiences taught you? What have you really, the, the most important things did you take away from, from all that? Oh, wow, so much. Um, you know, when I, when I would sit down to write, um, before I started working with Michael, it was often really based on what emotion do I want to be feeling and do I want to try to evoke musically? And Michael approaches film music, obviously the emotion has to be right, but he, I think, has taught me a lot about approaching a film score from an intellectual perspective and coming up with a concept whether it be instruments or drawing on a certain style of music um, that speaks to a level of the film that might not be on screen necessarily. Hmm. And I remember assisting Michael as he was trying to crack certain codes of films and um, I think in, in my initial stages I just thought, well, isn't it just sitting down and writing what you feel and although that is a big part of it there was a lot of thinking involved in coming up with an interesting concept like for instance in the nativity story um, using early music instruments um, to score this story that's set uh, well before the middle ages early music you know which was something that grew out of the medieval era to score a story that was, you know, 800 years, a thousand years prior. Um, and I remember when Michael kind of hit upon that and he kind of figured that out, there was this big sense of relief. And I got to see through the scoring of that film how Michael drew on that concept a lot. And, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that score or not, but we we did a lot of research trying to figure out what music would have been around during the time of Jesus' birth. And um, there's not a lot of records. In fact, a lot of the Jewish music that was there at the time, uh, the records of that music had been destroyed because of the the destruction of the temple, it's been kind of banished. The music that was played during that time has been banished, and it's been said when the temple is resurrected, that music can come back, but until then, that music is kind of forbidden. So there's a real dearth of information about that time. And obviously, we wanted to draw upon certain instruments or certain styles that might have been heard at the time. But then realizing that the story of the virgin birth was actually kind of popularized in the Middle Ages when the churches were that story, it, I'm, 
without even realizing it. You may watch the film and never ever realize that's what's going on, but if if you listen to the score or you have some sort of musical knowledge, I think that that brings a level of depth and commentary and intelligence to the score that I was really blown away by. And um, that's really been a big influence on how I approach film scores now is I think it's not necessarily a historical thing, but always trying to come up with an interesting perspective, whether it's a collection of instruments or even scales or something that um, that can help inform the music from an intellectual perspective. Well, I mean, it makes sense, too, because it gives the music uh, almost a personal history. You know, it, it ha it, it's lived before it came to this point, and it didn't just, you know, materialize out of thin air just for this film. So I kind of like that idea. <laughs> cool. Um, so now you're kind of... And now you have these two films that uh, that played at Sundance, and I've never been to Sundance. So, what was what was Sundance like? Especially, you know, having your work uh, featured there. It was really great. Um, it's always special to go to a film festival uh, with a film, um, and I had gone to Sundance a few years prior with Five Hundred Days. Michael didn't make it that year, and we were in the middle of doing all sorts of other stuff so I actually had to fly in and pretty much go straight to the show and then fly back home the next morning so I didn't really get to absorb the festival that time mm -hmm. um, and going with two films was really great uh, Spectacular was in the competition and so that was Friday night and it got so well received and it was kind of great to bask in the glow of that and see, <clears throat> see all the great um, reviews and press that were coming out over the weekend and then Sunday there was a deal announced with A24 and Ron Howard had tweeted about the film and um, Spielberg wanted to see the film and um, Weinstein was seeing the film and there was a bidding war and it was just very exciting to kind of walk around this snowy mountain town knowing that in certain condos and phone conversations and emails there was a lot of action happening um, for this film and, and, uh, and everyone on that film, James Ponsolt, the director and the producers were all just awesome people um, that I that I really liked and it was fun to hang out with them and just it's kinda like um, you know there's a something's gonna happen you don't know what but you know that something's going on so it's really fun right. and then Monday uh, the Way Way Back premiered um, to a sold out theater at the Eccles which is the big theater it's a 1200 seat theater and it got a standing ovation and the bidding war started immediately and then we all went out and kind of partied at a bunch of different places um, the filmmakers and some of the cast and crew and myself and they're all really fun people too Nat Faxon and Jim Rash who are both hilarious and Alice and Janney and we were all dancing on the dance floor while some of the producers were back cutting deals <laughs> And that went on all night long, and I think it was about 6 a.m. when the deal was sealed on that film with Fox Searchlight. So when I woke up, the news had broke that it had sold the Fox Searchlight for almost $10 million, which was, you know, it was a real thrill. And Fox Searchlight, you know, I have a relationship with them, and I really believe in them as, as a studio and as a distributor. So I was really happy to see that that's where it landed. Uh, it's a good, great place to land. They've always uh, uh, rescued I would, and really helped a lot of films kind of grow, so congratulations with that. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the two films, you, how far apart did you work on the two? Because they both premiered there. Uh, did, were they months apart? Did you work on them simultaneously? No, it was pretty much one right after the next. Wow, so uh, back to back. <laughs> yeah, Life of Pi ended, and I went right from that to... Ah, uh, it's the timeline is so blurry. That ran into some other project stuff that I was doing. Um, I think it was November 
that way, way back kicked up, and I, I had about five weeks with that, four or five weeks. Um, so kind of worked straight through that, and then we were mixing the way, way back when um, when the call for spectacular came through. So we hadn't even finished dubbing the way, way back and the spectacular started and that pretty much started right at the beginning of December and that we started doing the dub on, I think it was January 5th or something around there. So again, I had about four weeks to do that one and obviously all the holidays that were going on that right, yeah. missed this year. <laughs> So I mean as a as a creatively speaking is that exhausting for you would you would you have preferred to have like a break between projects to kind of refresh your I guess your idea bank or does that help you kind of just is, is it better maybe creatively to streamline from one to the next to keep your ideas flowing Um well I guess from a execution standpoint the machine was cranked up pretty well for the way way back mm -hmm. um I used the, the same music editor, um, Eric Stratman, who's great, who I met on Life of Pi on both of those films. So it was really great just from that side, kind of developing systems with him that we used in Life of Pi and then we used Way Way Back and Spectacular. Um, so, you know, the machine was pretty well oiled at that point. So from a execution standpoint, it was great. There's always the nervousness that there's going to be cross pollination. I was pretty concerned with that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, working on so many musical ideas for the way way back, a lot of them maybe get put to the side. Like in, in kind of my initial process when I'm hunting for things, there might be a lot of things that I set aside that ultimately I don't necessarily go back to, but they might be kind of related and in a similar world. And at the very beginning, I was just hoping that I wasn't going to be doing something that sounded similar, but the needs of Spectacular were different enough. It was a different enough film. It was a much darker drama, and um, the whole approach was totally different. I didn't really use piano. Um, I used different guitar sounds. Um, for each and Spectacular has a lot more synthesizer going on and it relied on that mm. quite more whereas Way Way Back was more piano and guitar and drums um, neither of them used strings but I think that the sonic palettes were just different enough that pretty quickly after working on Spectacular it was like okay we're in a new territory and um, I'd been really itching to use some of my analog synths that have been sitting around in my <laughs> studio, and I really got to pull those out for uh, Spectacular. So that's pretty cool. And so, when you look at a project when you're starting, like just blank slate as a composer, um, what aspect of the film really speaks to you the most? Is it the characters, the setting, the plot? I know you, you mentioned the intellectual uh, aspect of a score, or is it the look of the film, the pace? Like, what really speaks to you that really gets the first kind of idea on the page? I think it's always different. Um, yeah, I think it's always different. There's kind of an overall impact. Um, sometimes the film may not be highly stylized visually and it's not a particularly unique setting, but there's a character that's dealing with something really unique and therefore that's kind of the musical way in or sometimes it's a broader story with something that looks you know highly stylized and there's going to be a lot of moments where there's amazing visuals that um, that's going to kind of be the way in I mean that might be the case with Life of Pi mm -hmm. where the expansiveness or the colorfulness of things or the lack of color we're going to dictate musical approaches and instrumental or orchestrational choices. So I think it's always different. Um, I think it's just a matter of, of what's really of what's really hitting 
in a film when I when I watch it for the first time what's impacting me the most and then I always try to I mean there's a lot of conversations with filmmakers and obviously there's a great opportunity when you score a film to um, maybe bring out things that aren't registering so strongly that were in the script or that our ideas of the directors or the filmmakers. So I think it's kind of a question of what's the most impactful and what sh what needs to be helped as far as impact. And I think that's always different and comes from different angles. Right, yeah, no, I really agree with that too. Um, well, to, to wrap up, I always love to ask composers uh, this question. If you had the opportunity to score any film ever made, with no disrespect to the original composer, what film would you choose? Oh, wow. <laughs> um, gosh. The first Tron. Oh, that's a good one. Um, yeah, that's what leapt out first when you asked the question, so I'm just going to go with that. Any any reason behind it? Is, did, would you love to do like a completely electronic score kind of like that? Yeah, I mean, I, I've always been really big on, on synthesizers and mm -hmm. listen to electronic music since I was a kid in, in my parents' record collection. Um, you know, Vangelis and uh, Mannheim Steamroller, which they were family friends. Uh -huh. The records were kind of all around. And those old analog synthesizers with the orchestral arrangements that they did in Mannheim were always my some of my favorite records that they had and uh, Tomita and Kataro, which, you know, these things kind of blend into the new age side of things. But I was always totally into that stuff. And, um, and Tron was obviously, I mean, not obviously, but it was a big film for me when I was a kid. And I love sci-fi and a world full of, um, you know, glowing things <laughs> dark backgrounds is for some reason just one of my favorite things and um, and uh, yeah I, I, I and that movie in fact before the remake or legacy came right, out, right. Um, my friends and I watched Tron again and it really held up I really today think that that is a fantastic film and an amazing script and probably more relevant to our lives now that we live such a, com a computer-based life. Um, I found it to be way more relevant um, than I did when I was younger, and I think it's, it was really ahead of its time. Yeah, absolutely. And, they, and Disney did a really great job with the they remastered and everything, so it looks great now. Yeah, it's, it's really great. Well, it's a great answer. I really love that one. Um, and thank you so much, Rob, for your time. It's, it was a great chat, very uh, informative, and uh, and good luck with everything. Good luck uh, to Michael at the Oscars, and, uh, and hopefully we get to do this again sometime. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. It was a pleasure.